answers. And I don't see any more questions. So I would like to thank you, Mariana, for the first recording the presentation and uh, secondly from me here. And uh, as you know, this event we're uh, trying to raise awareness and educate people. And uh, you being an educator and a mentor for many people, uh, I had the opportunity to work a little bit with uh, Ash and with your group down there. And I, uh, I still uh, met a lot of people that uh, went back to other places and I still learn a lot from you and uh, continue working on Amloid. So thank you so much for that. and. Uh, Thank you very uh, for much for the here. invitation. It was a pleasure for me to be able to, to make it online. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, bye Mariana. And uh, we would like to proceed to, uh, with the next uh, speaker. And I know if, uh, uh, we have the next presenter already uh, getting ready for our uh, next presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, next invited speaker. To, uh, this, this, in this case, we're going to have uh, Stefan Schoenland. Uh, Stefan Schoenland is one uh, key member of uh, the formation of the Amyloid uh, uh, group in Heidelberg. And we have the opportunity to participate in International Symposium of Amyloidosis, uh, hosted by, uh, by him and uh, his group, including Ute. And, uh, you know, that city is amazing. We were welcomed with uh, fireworks. And uh, I was amazed to see how much they do. It's a small city, but they, they centralize a lot of things and they do a lot of things for amyloid. He's uh, currently now our uh, president of the International Society of Amyloidosis. And uh, I welcome him. Uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, for being here and uh, for giving us the opportunity to learn. You're also a uh, wonderful mentor and educator for many, many people. And we learned over the years about Amelo because of your group and because of uh, you uh, particularly. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, I would like to get you to start in your presentation of uh, non transplant approaches for the treatment of light chain amyloidosis. Uh, welcome, Stefan, and uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we do. And, and can you see um, my first slide? Yes. Okay, so then I can start. So the topic for the next 30 minutes uh, is non-transplant approaches for the treatment of AL amyloidosis. Here are my disclosures. Um, and these are the learning objectives. So um, not just for, for this talk, but I think for the whole meeting, uh, you will learn about the most common chemotherapy used in AL. You will learn about the challenges uh, for patients with advanced cardiac disease, and you will hear some information about supportive care strategies. Just a, a few words of introduction. Systemic Sorry. AL amyloidosis. Hmm? Sorry, Stefan, I don't think your presentation is moving. It's not moving? No, okay. I have you the first, the first slide. Now, now, now it's coming. It's moving? That's it, that's it close. Yeah, now it seems to be moving. Um, okay, but that's um, a problem um, because of the animation. Uh, wait a second. Uh, is it now moving? No. It's not, not yet, no. Moving? Uh, not yet. Okay, so now I have to do it uh, this way. Okay, it's a, that will be a yeah, yeah, it's a little bit challenge. <laughs> okay, so disclosures uh, you've seen here. Um, yes. And the learning objectives uh, I already mentioned. It's chemotherapy, most often used, challenges, and supportive care strategies in AL amyloidosis. Uh, just a few words of introduction. Um, the underlying disease of systemic AL amyloidosis is a clonal B cell disorder. It's mostly a plasma cell dyscrasia with a monoclonal gammopathy. And in this talk, we only focus on, on, on that uh, topic with the plasma cells. I don't, won't show slides about B cell lymphoma and Waldenstrom associated with uh, AL amyloidosis. The clone is usually small and low proliferative and translocation T1114, you will find in 50% or even more of patients. AL amyloidosis is the most common form of MGCS. This is monoclonal gammopathy of clinical significance. How do you diagnose these patients? Um, actually, the best way to diagnose is patients in the presymptomatic screening phase, 
where you have patients with, as a hematologist, with MGAS, and you screen them for biomarkers with, uh, for heart, kidney, uh, and kidney and liver disease. And if they are abnormal, then you screen for amyloidosis. And that's the best way to really find those patients early. However, most often, uh, signs and symptoms of amyloid organ involvement occur, and then uh, the hematologist looks for a monoclonal component present in serum or urine. Um, uh, if you want to diagnose the disease, you have to use uh, tissue, very often abdominal fat um, tissue to find the amyloid, and then it's very important to type it that you are sure that it's a kappa or lambda uh, AL amyloid you find and not, uh, for example, ATTR. Next step is to assess clonal disease, uh, organ involvement, uh, and to stage those patients. Uh, staging means that you use uh, biomarkers, I show I mean, in the next slide, uh, that you can uh, find out uh, about the prognosis of these patients and of the, about the amount of organ involvement. Of course, then it's also important to assess uh, the comorbidities at the end. So this is uh, the slide about biomarkers. Here you see two different cardiac staging systems. They both use uh, anti -pro BNP and troponin. And the other one, the, the Mayo Clinic staging system, uh, uses um, FLC in addition. And you can see nicely that the, those curves nicely uh, separate four different uh, groups of patients. Uh, the same is true for patients with renal disease. Here you use proteinuria and uh, EGFR um, to separate three different groups. And uh, patients with a normal GFR or better than 50 ml per minute and a proteinuria less than 5 gram per day, they, the risk of dialysis in the next two or three years is very low in these patients. So biomarkers have an, a really an, a very important role to stage these patients. So what about treatment strategies? Uh, as for other uh, systemic amyloidosis, the most important step is to reduce the amount of the precursor protein, and therefore you use chemotherapy. If you stop the production, we also heard this in the previous talk, then there's a high chance of stabilizing and even in the future of improvement of organ function. However, uh, we have not really fully understood the process of amyloid light chains uh, in the blood um, producing then at the end the fibrils in the organs. And there have been several attempts in the future, in the past, to use different drugs and antibodies to interfere with this uh, pathogenesis and to, uh, let me say, to further or to, uh, to, um, to, enhance, the, to, to enhance the organ function in a, in a more rapid way than just with chemotherapy alone. And I will talk a little bit of this at the end of the talk. Um, there has been much progress in understanding the disease and diagnosing the disease and in treating the disease. And here you see um, a timeline from the 80s until recently. And in, in the lower part, uh, there's all those different chemotherapy mentioned dealing with the clone to get rid of the toxic um, um, uh, light chain species in the blood. And in the top, you see uh, what has been really done to, um, uh, to measure the toxic protein uh, to characterize it uh, and also to uh, um, um, there's now even like for myeloma there are some some chances to, to to go in a higher sensitive level and to measure MRD in these patients. All these efforts uh, led to a dramatic pro a prognostic improvement in AL amyloidosis and here you see a nice work from the Boston group uh, um, going back the last 40 years, and you see in the different areas, eras, uh, how the five-year-old survival has improved, from coming from 15% to nearly 50% in the last um, in the last era. However, what has not been approved, uh, improved is uh, the um, the early mortality, and this is because still many patients are diagnosed with advanced cardiac disease and are diagnosed late. So um, what happened in the last couple of years is that we really now have more and more controlled trials and uh, leading sustained amyloidosis to uh, 
uh, bringing them to evidence-based medicine. And we will go, go back to those papers now in the next slide, slides. Um, talking about first-line therapy in low and intermediate risk patients, uh, there was this trial um, from the myeloma, from the European Myeloma Network, uh, comparing bortezomib melphalan dex with melphalan dex in a randomized fashion. Um, and uh, this was uh, the, the first trial really showing a difference in overall survival due to different treatment strategy. So with a long-term follow-up of these patients, uh, the survival for, for the triple uh, combination was much better than for the for MDEX alone with a significant p-value. And this was not true, only true for overall survival, but also for progression-free survival. Um, the primary endpoint was also met in this, in this, um, in this trial as the, the hematologic remission rate at uh, three months was higher with a triple chemotherapy or tesumid melphalandex against melphalandex. However, what, uh, what was surprising for, to us was that the cardiac and renal responses at three and six months were not really dramatically different uh, in this trial. So the next trial is the Andromeda trial, um, very famous trial, uh, now comparing daratumumab plus Cybor-D against Cybor-D. Um, and here the primary endpoint was uh, um, best response. And you see here that uh, complete remission was achieved in the Cybor-D uh, control arm in 27%, and it was doubled actually for the Dara Cyborg arm coming to 54%. And this trial, in this trial, then, uh, this dramatic better uh, hematologic response led really to a better cardiac response and a better renal response you see in the middle and on the right side of this, of this um, slide. Um, there was also the question if special subgroups could even, um, uh, if, if special subgroups are um, have a, a, a big benefit uh, from the addition of daratumumab. And what you can see here is that uh, if you look at the cardiac staging at baseline, uh, the more the heart is involved, actually, uh, the more profit was for the patients treated with, uh, with the dara combination. And um, uh, talking about translocation 1114, uh, there was also um, uh, a small difference um, um, page for patients having this translocation 1114, they uh, even had uh, a bigger profit regarding complete remission um, if they have 1114 translocation. And this is not really surprising because uh, we know that patients with uh, treated uh, with just with uh, bortezomib uh, and Cybor-D um, they don't have this high amounts of, of uh, complete remission when they have in their plasma cells a translocation 1114. So this is a kind of a summary uh, talking about hematologic and cardiac response in these two uh, phase three trials. And you see that with uh, more chemotherapy leading to, um, or more anticlonal therapies leading to more hematologic remissions at six months, and this is also leading to more cardiac response at six months. Um, and all these efforts have, have led uh, to uh, um, um, uh, have led to a new guideline done by the National Society of Amyloidosis and the European Hematology, Hematology Association. Um, it was published by Ashu Wichaleka uh, this year in amyloid, and here you see an overview. Uh, you check the patient if they have a neuropathy, and if no, and if they have a low or intermediate uh, amyloid disease, cardiac staging 1 to 3A, the first option is to use DARA cyborg D. And of course, if DARA is not available, uh, then you can treat these patients with cyborg D or BM DEX. However, in those patients with cardiac stage 3B, with a very poor prognosis, um, and um, if the, they don't tolerate um, multiple chemotherapies. So here you might use daratumumab single agents or dose modified Dara Cyborg D. And if Dara is not available, then you do dose modification with Cyborg D or BMDEX. If uh, the patient has a neuropathy, uh, you can't use uh, bortezomib in the first line. So here the option is single agent daratumumab uh, or Blendex 
or MDEX. Um, and I will come to the clux a little bit uh, later. Coming to, um, uh, to uh, relapse patients, so there was this, also this randomized trial using exasomib in relapsed AL patients. And here the primary endpoint was not reached. So there was no difference from exasomib against best physician's choice, which was mostly uh, lenalidomide. Uh, but ICSA was very well tolerated. And we think uh, this drug is a very attractive uh, therapy for patients with uh, nerve damage. Um, there are many retrospective um, analysis about daratumumab in, uh, in the relapse setting in AL. And you see that um, the hazard ratio, the hazard ratio, or no, the hematological remission for these patients was actually very, very high. And the advantage is that it's patients really can tolerate this, and you can use the same dosages as for multiple myeloma. Um, But uh, we found out that uh, using daratumumab, um, clonal and renal factors predict response and survival, um, especially those patients who have uh, a high clonal burden and a nephrotic syndrome, uh, they tend to have uh, less um, hematologic remission rates. You see here in this, in this figure. And this is also translating into a difference in overall and uh, progression-free survival. Um, in addition, here also some cytogenetic markers also might play a role like gain of 1Q, 2, 1. Uh, and uh, the rationale behind or the thoughts behind this is, is this, if you have patients with really a renal disease, they might lose a lot of antibody just as they are nephrotic. And so they have less activity of this antibody in the body. Um, talking about imits um, in the relapse setting, uh, there are also some prospective trials, but also many retrospective analyses. And you see that the uh, uh, remission rate is not as high as the ones with uh, DARA tumor map. Um, and also in opposite to DARA, the recommended dose is much lower uh, than in multiple myeloma. We often use only 10 or 15 milligram in those um, patients. And again here, we found out that uh, clonal and cardiac factors uh, predict survival in those patients uh, if they have a high clonal uh, burden or if they again the plasma cells show gain of 1q21 or if the heart is severely damaged those patients um, do not as well as the others if you treat those with uh, imits. Um, there are also a few um, studies about and here you can really say that this drug is better tolerated uh, in AL patients uh, in opposite to, uh, to lenalidomide. Uh, we have just previously shown some data at the ISA 22 uh, symposium about triple therapy with elotuzumab and imits. Here we used mostly pomalidomide in relapsed patients. It was 30 patients we, we could analyze. And on the right side, you see um, you see um, uh, the, the remission rates, which uh, the overall remission rate with CR and low DFLCPR and VGPR and PR was around 30% in those heavily pretreated patients. Um, and here on the left side, you see the overall survival and the event free survival. And again, uh, the most common side effects uh, with Revlimid was fatigue, edema, and infections. And uh, POMA was better tolerated in this triple therapy. Again, uh, there are a few um, studies about bendamustine in the relapse setting in AL patients. Um, and here I show you some results in non-IgM AL patients. There was one uh, prospective study and a retrospective analysis showing that if patients respond to bendam, um, they have also a chance of, of control of the plasma cell disease for a couple of months. I already mentioned venetoclax. I think this is a big hope for the patients, especially for those who have uh, translocation 1114. And now we have uh, even four um, retrospective analyses uh, published or shown in the, in the last ISA symposium. On the left side, you see the first uh, paper, about 12 patients with a nearly 90% um, remission rate. Then the first multicentric international study with 44 patients. 
in 11, 14 uh, positive patients, again, nearly 80% um, CR, VGPR rate. We have analyzed the first 28 patients in our center, um, all with titrification M14, and we, we have, have seen a CR, VGPR rate of 64%. And there was now also this multicentric French study uh, with, uh, again, close to 80% uh, remission rate. And overall, um, it's a well-tolerated drug in AL patients. So, and then also, again, ISA and IA made guidelines for non transplant chemotherapy after first line. And uh, here's the matter if you, if you have a patient who is uh, PI naive or has uh, at least a prolonged uh, response to, to a PI, then you can use, again, Cyborg-D, BMDEX, XRDEX, or DARA. Uh, board D. Um, the second line option, if, if these patients are refractory to proteasome inhibition, and then it's the matter if they are imits naive, you can use Revlimid or lenalidomide, or you can, of course, use daratumumab, also in combination. Um, if you have uh, patients in second line option refractory to lenalidomide, then you might use POMA or vendomastin. Um, and of course, for those patients uh, who are 1114 positive, um, the second line, one good second line option is Venetoclax, as I just um, have shown you in the last slide. What are other novel uh, plasma cell agents in AL? And of course, um, everybody in myeloma is talking about um, CAR T cells. And here we, I can show you also some first um, results of uh, a uh, study from Israel with uh, four patients and with a, a case report with a long-term follow-up uh, transplanted and treated in uh, Barcelona. Um, all four patients in Israel attained a complete remission and organ response with a BCMA CAR T cell. And um, the, the one patient treated in Barcelona also reached a, a very good remission, even a negative MRD in the bone marrow with a, um, organ response and this response is uh, at least hold true for uh, two years now in the last in the in the follow-up paper. Um, there is another BCMA drug. This is Belantamab, um, Mafodotin, and here also two um, small studies are published. Uh, the one on the right side is published in paper form in Blood Cancer Journal uh, with 11 patients with an overall response rate of 64%, and also the authors claimed that it was manageable. And we have this, uh, again, this European Myeloma Network Trial 27 with also 11 patients with a median follow-up of nine months. Uh, and of these 11 patients, now four patients are still on treatment. Uh, we also claim that it's a manageable safety profile, but the eye toxicity is really, it is a problem in that, um, uh, in that um, with that therapy, again, leading to an overall response rate of more than 70%. Um, just one slide about supportive therapy. Uh, uh, here I just took a slide from uh, the paper of uh, Giovanni Palladini from Blood 2020. Um, patients with nephrotic syndrome and heart, um, advanced heart disease, they benefit from salt restriction and diuretics. Um, you can give midodotrine for hypertension. Patients with recurrent uh, arrhythmic syncope may benefit from pacemaker implementation. The use of uh, defibrillators is still controversial, I would say. Gabapentin or pregabalin is useful for uh, neuropathic pain in these patients. Um, and nutritional support is important to ensure adequate caloric intake, which is very often a problem in these patients also when they receive uh, chemotherapy. Uh, the matter of uh, the discussion about organ transplant uh, is still, I think, under debate. Uh, but in patients with uh, irreversible end-stage organ dysfunction, despite complete hematological response, um, uh, kidney transplantation uh, might, be a, uh, might be a good choice for those patients. And talking about cardiac transplant, if uh, you transplant a patient with heart, uh, you should, at, after the transplant, you should treat those patients with effective chemotherapy to uh, protect the new heart uh, for further amyloid uh, damage. Um, last point is anti-fibrillar antibodies. Um, 
here we have um, two uh, antibodies. The one is from Kilo 101, and, and this antibody showed in phase one um, trials uh, that there was uh, evidence of organ response in the majority of patients in the phase two. Um, uh, this was again highlighted organ responses, and um, this antibody now uh, is analyzed in two different, uh, in two um, um, phase three trials, um, dealing one with um, mere stage 3A patients and the other one with 3, 3B. And then uh, we hope that we will see in a randomized fashion in, uh, for, this, uh, for this antibody um, a difference to the placebo arm maybe in one, two or three years time when, the, when these trials are done. Um, there was this former NeoD01 uh, um, antibody now called Bertabimab. Um, and here again, also in initial phase one to two trials, there was a demonstration of heart and renal responses. But uh, the first uh, randomized trials here in phase two and phase three, they did not uh, could show a benefit uh, in the overall population um, with this antibody. But a post hoc analysis uh, uh, could show a possible benefit in advanced cardiac AL. And for that reason, there is a, a, an also now another trial with this, uh, with this drug focusing on Mayo stage four patients uh, to confirm this post hoc analysis. And uh, probably we also will need one or two years to, or even longer, to see um, if this uh, holds true. Um, there was a couple of papers about doxycycline because this uh, drug disrupts fibrils in vitro. Um, but um, and also some retrospective analysis showed some reduction of mortality. Um, but there was now one recent negative randomized trial showing no benefit uh, for the drug doxycycline. And also the European trial now has been stopped. The European randomized trial has been stopped. Uh, so currently we think the utility of doxycycline is in question. Um, last slide about therapies. Um, there is some, um, there is some in vitro studies about light chain stabiliz stabilizers, um, and the idea behind is that if if you can stabilize the the light chains in the blood, uh, then they will not lead uh, to amyloid fibrils and not to cell death um, in these patients. And um, there's at least to my knowledge uh, no phase one trial started. Uh, for this kind of approach. Coming to the summary about novel non-transplant approaches for the treatment of AL, uh, I think I could show you that there are major developments in anticlonal treatment. Combination therapies are more powerful, but also more toxic. Darutumumab is very effective. The question is, it's also um, in nephrotic patients. Um, High-dose treatment with malfalan and transplant is still being used in low-risk patients, and here you will see uh, studies presentation later on. And cytogenetics and clonal burn matters in these patients, and also Dr. Fonseca's presentation will go into that, showing you more details. I think there are many open questions, but um, I think two, uh, for me, these two are very important, and that is what should be the second line therapy for patients not responding after Dara Cyber D or relapsing very soon after this very good uh, first line approach. And nowadays, uh, not talking about transplant, what is the role of melphalan uh, in these patients? And finally, we still wait for licensed antifibrillar and light chain stabilizing uh, therapy in these patients. I want to thank the colleagues who helped me with the slides. Ute, uh, my colleague Ute from Heidelberg, and Giovanni Palladini from Pavia, and all the other mentioned here who worked on many different uh, guidelines uh, in the last one or two years. And finally, um, just ISA Congress 22 uh, happened in Heidelberg, but we now already work on the next ISA Congress. And this will be in the Mayo Clinic in Rochester at the end of May 2024. And I hope many of you will join us here to discuss then the new results, for example, of modern chemotherapy. Thank you again for invitation, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just uh, uh, asking to, 
any people from the audience, if there is any questions, please do type it on the chat uh, session and uh, I will read it. Or if you guys want to do any questions,